Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Rachel Withers, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of The Politics and I am so pleased to be hosting uh, this event as part of the Australia Institute's 30th anniversary year, uh, where they're celebrating 30 years of big ideas. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present and any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here tonight. I think it's especially important um, as we think about Australia's climate record and its impact on our region to remember that Indigenous peoples have been caring for this continent for tens of thousands of years as the world's oldest continuous living culture and we still have so much to learn from them. Speaking of learning, I am thrilled to introduce tonight's speakers as we question whether Australia is really on the brink of transforming its international standing from climate laggard to climate leader, or if we are playing a double game and hoping that our Pacific neighbours do not catch on. First up, we're going to hear from former President of Kiribati, His Excellency Anote Tong. Anote Tong was the President of the Republic of Kiribati from 2003 to 2016. He's a member and the current chair of the Pacific Elders Voice Group, comprised of former national academic and diplomatic leaders from the Pacific region. Throughout his terms in office, Anote highlighted the human dimensions of the climate change challenge with a special focus on the existential threat it poses for Pacific Islands and other communities on the front line. In 2015, he was awarded the Sun Huck Peace Prize and has been nominated twice for the Nobel Peace Prize, as well as other awards for his work on climate change and ocean conservation. After that, we will hear from independent MP for Kuyong, Monique Ryan. Monique stepped away from her former role as Director of Neurology at the Royal Children's Hospital and won her seat in the 2022 federal election, calling for more urgent action on climate change and for integrity in politics. And after the speeches, these two leaders will be joined on a 20 minute panel by Executive Director of the Australia Institute, Dr. Richard Dennis, who has stepped in to replace Polly Hemming tonight. Richard is a prominent Australian economist, author and public policy commentator who has spent the last 20 years moving between policy focused roles in academia federal politics and think tanks. He's a regular contributor to The Monthly and the author of several books, including Econobabble, Curing Affluenza, and Dead Right, How Neoliberalism, How Neoliberalism Ate Itself and What Comes Next. And after that, we'll open the floor up to questions from the audience. And just a reminder to make sure that those are questions and not statements. So without further ado, I'd like to invite His Excellency Anote Tong, former president of Kiribati, to the mic. Thank you, Rachel, for the introductions. Let me begin, as we always do in Kirpas, our tradition is uh, <clears throat> whenever we meet, when you, whenever we interact, we, we bless each other. So let me begin with a blessing to you by saying, what I would say is, come the Maori meaning, may you be blessed, and please bless me back by saying Maori. Okay, let me begin with a blessing. Come the Maori. Mm, okay, half-hearted, but it will do. <laughs> Again, I, I want to take this opportunity to, of course, to acknowledge the elders, the spirits of this land, and uh, of course, ask their blessing as we have this conversation. So vital to the future of humanity, so vital to the future of uh, people on the front line of climate change, but I can assure you, to each and every one of you. And so, when I have these talks, I really don't know where to begin because I've been doing it for so long. But let me begin from the beginning when I started um, advocating, and it was in my first inaugural speech at the United Nations, 2004. And uh, I remember, I was wondering, what, what do I say at the United Nations General Assembly? Because everybody was talking about the usual developmental challenges that uh, uh, developing countries face. And of course, terrorism was the issue at the time, international terrorism. And I said, oh, i got nothing to do. we got nothing to do with terrorism. <clears throat> but I'd come across a part of a report of the, the third assessment report of the IPCC, which uh, made reference of um, sea level rise. And I thought, for me, I thought that's, 
good reason to, for alarm bells to go because, you know, we come from uh, atoll islands. Kiribati is made of 30 atoll islands, 33 atoll islands. Atolls are very low-lying strips of land. We say two meters above sea level on average, but that is not true. During the very high tides, we do get flooded. And um, let me share, I think uh, Nick will confirm that uh, just come back from the Marshall Islands, which are flooded, which were flooded during the last uh, new moon, okay? Seriously flooded. The, the water just comes in and stays there until the tide goes out. Tuvalu was also flooded. We checked back home because I'd been ringing back to find out because I, I knew the tides would be high. But fortunately, we got flooded, but not badly. Maybe for the reason that uh, there was calm weather, but calm weather does not always guarantee that they would be safe. There could be pressure changes which push the water higher than they normally should be. So that is happening. And so the, um, going back to the IPCC reports, <clears throat> Fourth assessment report, which came out in 2007, uh, indicated that um, whether we cut emissions, global emissions to zero, global temperatures will continue to rise, sea level will continue to rise, and islands like ours in the Pacific will be given up to the end of the century to continue to be viable communities. Of course, that's been reviewed with the sixth assessment report, to, which came out in 2022, with now saying that we have until 2060. Okay, so what is it? What, where, what is our future? Even as we went to Paris in two, 2015, I, do, I had read the fourth assessment report, then why did we go? Why did we continue to push, advocate? For the simple reason that even if we are gone, I think it's important for the rest that we fight this. Because otherwise we would have nowhere else to go. Because once our islands are flooded, we would have, we need, we would need to go somewhere else. And so that's been the scenario. The options are becoming very limited for us. And so there's always skeptics everywhere. Even at home, we got skeptics, people saying no, even if the water is lapping at our doorsteps, and they do. I've got, uh, I was taking shots earlier this year and early last year with uh, the water coming in our front door, uh, sorry, our back porch. And, uh, that's been happening with greater frequency, greater intensity, and it is not receding. It's not getting any better. And of course, I'm challenged quite often. I've been called a scaremonger, my, even by my own people. Uh, we are a highly Christian society. So the, the church leaders, they, they challenge me right in front of me, and they say, oh, the, the, uh, these people who think, the scientists who think that um, this is happening, they are challenging the word of God because you remember the covenant, you know, with the floods, there was, there was this rainbow. And so people take it rather literally. Our current leader, my, my, my successor, keeps saying that we are in the hands of God, sure. But God has given us the means to understand and interpret the actions of what is happening. And God is not creating this, we are. We are responsible for this. And so, the question is, what options do we have? Now, given the scenario that's been predicted, either we build our, our resilience to the extent that we will be able to withstand the rising seas, or we move somewhere else, okay? Now, let me give you some, I'm, I'm not the scientist here, but I'm just getting the numbers from the, sci the, the scientists. If the Greenland ice sheet melts, then we are talking about a seven meter rise in sea level. If the South Pole, the, uh, the, what, the doomsday glacier, whatever it is, the, 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 the Antarctica melts, then we're talking about a 60 to 70 meter rise in sea level. And so the question will be, could we ever build up the kind of resilience in order to remain above the rising seas? And I guess the answer is, maybe not in time, but perhaps we might be able to do it for the next few decades. But beyond that, it's most unlikely. This is why when I was looking for solutions, I went all over the place looking, and I even looked at floating islands. Somebody, the Japanese were advocating the idea of floating islands, and I was attracted to it. 
It was very much science fiction, but what are the choices that we have? And so these are the challenges which we are faced with. And this is the moral challenges, the challenge which is facing humanity. This is why I've always referred to climate change as the greatest moral challenge for humanity. When people who know that what they are doing is detrimental to the future of people, yet they continue to do it. Where's the morality in that? And I guess this is the challenge that I've been raising to your governments, successive governments, challenging them, it's bad. Why do you continue to do it? I was here in 2022 with a colleague of mine, the, the former president from, from uh, Palau, to try and talk to your government while they were still in the process of formulating hopefully their policy on climate change, but they had already decided. They're gonna cut to zero emission by 2050, but nothing else. And we said, no, that's fine, wonderful, but that's not the problem. It's a huge, it's, it's your huge volume of exports. And the answer I got was this, no, that's not our problem. It's not our problem. It's up to the countries that buy. And so, we need a better answer than that. We need a moral approach. We need people who are not only looking at what it means to them politically, but what it means to them as human beings, as people who have, who can decide, who can make a decision either to allow us to have a, a viable future or destroy our future and the future of humanity. In conclusion, let me just simply say this, that it's always being referred to as a specific problem. I assure you it is not. And I'm sure, I was here speaking in 2018, and I remember speaking in Sydney, and I said, I'm sure many of you here don't believe that what I'm talking about is relevant to your lives. But let's see what happens in the next coming summer. And if, of course, you know what happened in the summer of 2019, 2020. You had the worst fires. And I feel very guilty that I just condemn Australia. <laughs> yeah. But I think those are actually examples on the ground. It's happening in different parts of the world. I, I was in Adelaide and uh, talking, and people were fanning themselves because it was extra hot. And I said, well, you better have your government change your policy. Okay. Got, did I say that or did I say change the government? Okay. I didn't mean change the government. <laughs> I didn't mean change the government, otherwise I'd be in trouble, I'd be deported. But what I meant is the government has to change its view on climate change. So it is as much your problem as it is ours. We will be the first to go down, but you will follow unless we do the things that are needed in order to avert it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Somewhat a tough uh, act to follow. Uh, but thank you um, to uh, Your Excellency, and, and let me also acknowledge that the land on which I stand is unceded, and that, like many of my constituents, or I know many of you are here tonight, thank you, that I continue to hope that in the fullness of time, this country will achieve the maturity necessary to give, to a seed, a, a Indigenous people, not only a voice to Parliament, but also treaty and truth, and to make real progress towards reconciliation with Indigenous Australians. So what I thought I would do, and, and thank you so much for those, uh, those initial comments, Your Excellency, what I might just do in the next 10 minutes or so is give a picture of where we are in Australia at the moment, uh, and, and how we are placed as a nation uh, in, in res with respect to the challenges that you've just enunciated. Unfortunately, it's not a very pleasant picture. So I'm probably telling you things that you know, but it's probably worth setting the scene. So we are currently, Australia, the third largest fossil fuel exporter on the globe, behind only those marvellous sovereign nations, Saudi Arabia and Russia. About 70% of the coal and the gas that we dig up, we export, and they are 
those, you know, the, those emissions that we don't count and for which we accept no responsibility at this point in time. Since May 2022, the Albanese government, which, as we all know, was elected with a promise to end the climate wars, has approved four new coal mines. It has approved the drilling of 116 gas wells. It has facilitated the development of one of the world's largest untapped gas reserves in the Beetaloo Basin. And it has actively provided a new subsidy for development of the Middle Arm Precinct in Darwin Harbour, $1.5 billion for that. It's a, a project which it has itself described as a key enabler of the development of the Beetaloo Basin. There are at present 100, 100 new gas and coal development proposals in front of the Albanese government. 44 of them are for gas and oil, and they would lead to, if were they all developed, approved and developed, they would lead to tens of millions of tonnes of additional carbon dioxide emissions every year. 56 new coal, and coal projects, which could double our coal production were they all to go ahead. If all of those were approved, cumulatively, they would triple our total emissions relative to those in 2021 to 2022. At a time when we are uh, uh, um, advertising to ourselves and globally that we are trying to cut our emissions. At the same time, I would also note, and relevant to today's discussion, that while we're saying that we're going to cut our emissions, what we have to do in that process involves buying carbon credits, potentially from the Pacific nations and from other nations, in order to, rather than focus, focusing on decarbonisation nationally, to, to do some, what you know, you, I have to call some pretty fuzzy math, uh, to, to try and balance the books in a way that we can sell to ourselves and to uh, colleagues over overseas. Some more fun figures. In 2020-23, we spent eight times as much on fossil fuel subsidies, direct fossil fuel subsidies, that's $11.1 billion, than we spent on development assistance to the Pacific, that being $1.4 billion. So we're left in a situation where we are have a government which is trying to talk the talk, but we still have a government which is internally completely inconsistent. Remembering that the Resources Minister, Madeleine King, declared in the 48 hours before the May 2022 election that she was all on board with gas, and she told gas producers that. And we have had a, a government which has passed a number of important pieces of legislation, but we ha has never never come to terms with or agreed to pass the sort of duty of care legislation which we'll be talking around about in Hawthorne tomorrow night, but which would guarantee that the next generation will not be dealing with the health and climate impact of the emissions that we are currently exporting, essentially, and, 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 and using, developing um, and um, generating locally as well, but primarily exporting. So we have this entirely contradictory rhetoric from our national government. Last year, when Chris Bowen, the National Climate Change and Energy Minister, released the 2023 Annual Climate Change Statement, he said that national security threats from climate change already present serious risks to Australia and the region. At the same time, we had the Office of National Intelligence producing a report which the government will not release, which we know has already has also identified climate change as the biggest strategic threat to this country. And Chris Bowen went on with the climate change statement to say that climate change is an existential national security risk to our Pacific partners, and it presents unprecedented challenges for our region. So we have acknowledgement from the government, one would think, of the significance and the seriousness of this, this problem. And yet at the same time, we have, have had successive governments 
both the, the preceding nine years of, of, of Conservative government, but I would argue now the 18 months that we've had of the Albanese government, when we are actively trying to water down the climate agreements that we, we make, that where we've not come to terms with accounting of our emissions, and that's an ongoing problem and something that we will be talking about in Parliament in the next 12 to 18 months, the fact that the emissions that we record are vastly, vastly undercounting the emissions that we generate, and which is actively going out and trying to both offload our responsibility for the emissions that we generate, and I thought that the, the sea dumping bill that the government passed last year was a particularly egregious example of that, where essentially we are proposing to take our, our emissions and, and store them under the sea very close to uh, Timor Leste, despite all of the, the, the problems with that, both the, both the problems with the, the processing, the fact that it's an unproven technology and the fact that there are very significant and serious uh, risks associated with the proposals that are put in place. But basically it was a government uh, agreement with Santos and the government has doubled down on that most recently with another piece of legislation which we will probably be debating in the next couple of weeks, which also gives free reign to Santos to to, to um, undertake further explanation, exploration overseas, but also to uh, ex increase its carbon capture and storage plans offshore, off the shore of Australia. So what are we left with? <laughs> well, we're left with Pacific nations who can fight back in one of two ways. Either, either via carbon credits and by refusing to engage with our country in contracting for the sale of carbon credits, which is something which would hurt us and make, us, make our lives a bit more difficult, but would also have significant repercussions for those Pacific nations, knowing as we do that they are very dependent on Australia for, for aid and for support, but for potentially as well for, for the income that could be derived from those carbon credits. Or the Pacific nations can stop playing nicely with us and refuse to co-host, for example, COP31. So Australia is quite keen to uh, co-host COP, COP31 and in, in, in 2026 and, and the reality is that if we do that we can make ourselves out to be a responsible player in the field. But I think some of us would argue that there are some, some issues there and, and that in putting our hands up and representing ourselves to be responsible players internationally on that stage we are being less than honest. But I think, unfortunately, in our sphere of interest in the Pacific, there's a real danger that despite the fine words of people like Penny Wong, who has spoken very clearly about the need for improved Pacific partnerships, there's a real concern that we are continuing to behave like the uncle that no one wants to have who puts the hard word on you at inconvenient times and puts you in a really difficult situation and when you speak up about it, it's to your own cost and the cost of the people around you. So that's not a very pretty picture, I'm afraid. Uh, and as a member of a crossbench which has, I think, a fairly united position and that it feels great to stress about this situation and great frustration at some of the actions of the government which has not walked the walk that we hoped it would walk when it was elected in, in May 2022. I guess it's time, uh, setting the scene for a discussion with you and, and, and with my colleagues about where we go to from here on, on what it would be reasonable for our country to expect of our Pacific partners. Thank you.
Well, thank you both so much for those remarks. Um, I wanted to start with a question for everyone on the panel, um, especially coming off the back of the next very scathing review of the first 18 months of the Albanese government. Um, we often sort of hear about the climate wars being over and how much better the current government is than the last one. Um, but I was wondering if you could each sort of give me a score out of 10 that you would give the first 18 months of the Albanese government on climate change and then also add what you would like to see them do in the, the second half of this term to get them to a 10. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, look, I'll probably say six because I think there is a genuine desire in the government to, uh, to, to take action on these things. And I think Chris Bowen and Tanya Plibersek are generally commi genuinely committed to it. I think they understand the problems. You know, and the frustration is that we don't <coughs> get the action that we hope to get. The sea dumping legislation was gobsmackingly bad and we were shocked when it sort of landed. It was the sort of thing, like I didn't even think of a fancy name for it. I mean, sea dumping, you know. <laughs> I mean, could have called it, you know, fancy fairy gas under the sea and, you know, it'll be really fun, Bill, and we might have been hoodwinked. But, um, yeah, I think there's a real desire for change, but and I'm not a politician, so I don't understand how, well, I could be a politician, but so I don't understand how these things work and how they operate, but it's very, very clear that there's these vested interests. And it's, it's so hard to, to talk rationally and clearly and stuff based on the evidence where you know, we've got this situation where you think people said the climate wars were over. But, you know, two weekends ago, the Leader of the Opposition flew to Perth for an hour and came back saying that nuclear was this really great idea that he'd just come up with. <laughs> and now we're stuck in this ridiculous argument about something that we all thought was sort of done and sorted, well, you know, long ago. So it's so hard sometimes you feel like you can't get oxygen to actually talk about the things that we know, we accept, and we need to do. No, it takes being di diplomatic. <laughs> um, look, I, I'm, I'm going to give them a fail um, for the simple reason that I hear what Monique's saying, and, and I agree. I think Chris Bowen and Tanya Plibersek do know. And I think Madeleine King understands too. And she's running rings around them. So I think we have to kind of really put aside how do we feel about people and ask what are they doing? Because if you knew there was a problem and you understood the problem, but then you silently participated in not solving it, I don't think your knowledge of the problem or your unspoken desire to act on it counts. Like I just think if you want to put your hand up, as Monique has, to represent people, I think the job is to do what you think is right. So... Of course this government is better than Scott Morrison, but that's not a scientific benchmark <laughs> of, of any relevance. The question is that the science says we need no new coal and gas. And not only are we still building it, we're still subsidising it. So I, 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 I hate to say it, I think the fact that nice people know and understand makes it worse, not better. Because... The, the problems that we just heard Anote describe for the people at Kiribati are existential in the very short term. And they're existential for all of us eventually. So kind of nice people who wish they could do better but doing nothing, I think is actually worse because they, they disempower us with their, with their niceness when what we actually need is their bravery. Anote, I might. <laughs> I might adapt that question slightly for you save, you, save you giving the Australian government a score, but I was wondering how you have found the difference in trying to advocate for these issues with the new government compared to the old one. Well, let me say that uh, <coughs> with your former government, we never ever interacted. And the only interactions I've had with your former leaders were from the former government was uh, not nice. I remember our, uh, I said confrontation, I suppose is the word, in, in Port Moresby at the forum meeting before the, the Paris meeting. And of course, I was well aware of uh, the position of your former prime minister on, 
on climate change. We know what he thinks about climate change, and he said it. And so we never really had any interaction with your former government. But of course, we'd always been made to understand that the alternative government would be a lot more uh, positive in, its, uh, <coughs> in the way it would deal with uh, climate change. That's while I think it was said, and we always expected it. This is why when I came into 2022 to discuss this, it was a huge disappointment to be told that we will continue to what? But it's not our responsibility. Okay, and then I asked the question, so do you expect to transition at any point? And if you do, do you, do you have a road map? I don't think there is a road map. And so in terms of number, you know, wh what kind of a score, uh, maybe it's, it, it's definitely better than the, the previous administration, but it, it does not go anywhere near solving the problem. The one thing that I've always found very odd and somewhat contradictory is that we are given aid to build our climate resilience, but at the same time, everything is being done to, to destroy our climate resilience. Okay, so that in itself is a contradiction. Thank you. Manik, I wanted to ask you as a representative of an electorate that is especially fired up about climate change, and I know several of your constituents are here tonight, how how much do you think your electorate has been convinced by the Albanese government, as you say, talking the talk? Well, I usually ask them. <laughs> um, I, 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 think, I think people understand, people in, in Kuyong understand that, that they, they follow things pretty closely. So I think most people would be in the same position that I am, that there's been disappointment um, and a feeling that we'd perhaps hope, well, definitely hoped for more. Uh, and that we need, we would need to, to be happy, I guess, with, with how the government has operated on climate, that we would need some more clear, as you say, pathways, and, you know, some more certainty about within each sector of the economy, uh, how we're going to go forward. And, and, and people have been asking, the, the business has been asking for certainty, um, all of the sectors have sort of said we need a, a more definitive roadmap about how we are going to progress to, even if it's just 43% by 2030, which, you know, independents have, have asked for a sort of a rejigging of that commitment, um, or, or net zero by 2050. Uh, that w and it's been, it's, there was a, I'm sure many of you would have seen last year, there was an internal um, from the department review, which basically said there is no roadmap. And so that is something that we need to see. But it's, it's in, it is extremely frustrating. The other thing that we've been waiting for, you asked what, what else we're waiting for, we're waiting for the EPPC Act, which we had hoped or expected to see in the middle of last year, and which we oh, are not even guaranteed to see this year. So that's the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, which is a 20-plus-year-old piece of legislation which addresses a lot of things, not, not climate specifically, but a lot of environmental concerns, and which could be manipulated so as to give greater protection of the climate. And there's been a lot of pressure on the government to do that, and they've resisted that thus far. So if there's the one thing that you wanted, that would be the thing. In that when, with the EPPZ Act that we see it this year, it's going to be broken up into at least four big chunks, it's a massive piece of legislation, that we see it this year and it gives us some more clarity about that roadmap because that would make people feel better. But th the great fear is that it's going to be huge, we're going to debate it if we don't get through it and then we go to an election that we've lost that opportunity. So there's a real sense of um, nervousness about how that's going to go and how we can prosecute our case effectively while not wanting perfect to be the enemy of good. Richard, I wanted to ask you about um, the ways in which the Albanese government has tried to restore Australia's international standing <laughs> on, on these issues. I mean, we saw Climate and Energy Minister Chris Bowen go to COP28 at the end of last year and take on a, a leadership role in pushing the, the phase out or the phase down of fossil fuels in the, the draft agreement. Um, what do you make of this um, charm offensive, as the Australian newspaper has called it? 
Oh, I, I think it's a fraud. Um, I mean, you just heard uh, you just heard a note say how bizarre that in Australia we're spending a tiny amount of money to help the Pacific adapt to rising sea levels while we're giving far more money to subsidise fossil fuel expansion. Like, this is a joke, except it's not funny. Um, we are... <coughs> Yeah, we're, we're going to international climate talks and agreeing that we want to phase out fossil fuels when we're approving them at home. Like, this is not complicated stuff. If you want to transition away from fossil fuels, here's a tip, don't build new ones. Do you follow that? <laughs> uh, anything other than that is, is it's, 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 it's a fraud. So, you know, what would be honest is to say, look, in Australia, we don't care... Uh, we think we'll be selling the last tonne of coal and the last boatload of gas. We want to make as much money as we can out of it. No one's going to stop us. Away we go. Right? That's, that's what we're doing. But to kind of pretend to, to, to go to an international climate conference and adopt a leadership position and agree that over time we should transition away from fossil fuels while literally opening <laughs> new gas and coal plants at home literally in their first budget, one and a half billion dollars for the middle arm gas processing hub. I mean, this, this is just ridiculous. And unfortunately, I can go into why this might be or how they've got away with it for so long, but none of this is designed to be talked about, okay? What we're supposed to talk about is domestic climate policy. We're supposed to pat ourselves on the back for having lots of solar panels. We're supposed to get excited about a 43% emission reduction target and we're supposed to have a debate about maybe it should be 50 instead of 43. We are all supposed to just have a big long chat about fuel efficiency standards in Australia and just shh, don't mention the fact that we're the third biggest fossil fuel exporter in the world. The problem is that for decades, both major parties have talked about climate policy as if all that matters was what happens within our borders. And both major parties are still stuck in that paradigm. So they're just, they kind of, Chris Bowen feels genuinely hurt and sad, and Tanya Plibersek feels very sad that people keep picking on them. No, I'm not kidding, because look at the good, look at the money I got for a koala and look at the solar panel over here. Why do people keep talking about enormous new coal mines? They're genuinely perplexed that this keeps coming up. So the reason it doesn't make any sense is it's never made any sense, but it's really not until the independents have come along and started to ask these simple questions and demand answers to them that it all looks as absurd as it is. But just let me leave you with, like, forget all the scope one, scope two, scope three accounting. Here's how the science works. It doesn't matter where in the world the coal is burnt, it causes our climate to change. It doesn't matter where in the world the gas is burnt, it causes our climate to change. That's all you need to remember. All the boatloads of gas we sell harm our reef, as well as Anote's house. And we're sitting here saying, let's sell a lot more gas and a lot more coal, but don't worry, there's an accounting rule that says it doesn't count. It doesn't matter where you burn it. <laughs> it causes climate change. And here we are saying, oh, well, just don't look at that. Like everyone's got that corner of their house or that room with the door they don't want to open because it's full of all the stuff that we haven't kind of tidied up. That's fossil fuel exports in Australian democracy. Just don't look in there. A note sticking with the UN Climate Summit, you mentioned... Um, in your speech about the fact the Albanese government is very keen to host uh, COP31, which is the 2026 UN Climate Summit, and they're really keen to have the Pacific nations involved in co-hosting that bid. Um, the, the group that you're the chair of, the Pacific Elders Voice, put out an ad uh, last year basically calling for other leaders not to um, accept Australia's request until, until Australia shows some real commitment on fossil fuels. Um, how are you feeling about that bid now and, and where is all of that up to with Pacific Elders Voice? Well, <coughs> we've come to, we have to accept that we're no longer in office so we cannot uh, make happen what it is we are saying. But I think 
What we said is, it's very clear that if Australia is going to be hosting, it's got to show some very genuine commitment to committing to some serious climate action. And one of the things that uh, Australia knows, we know, everybody else knows that unless there is a commitment to reducing, uh, to stopping in the opening of new fossil fuel uh, mines, you, you c it it's a doesn't make sense at all. And so, we are. We were saying, no, don't. don't. We are encouraging Pacific Island countries not to be a part of the process, if Australia is not going to commit, making any concrete commitments. Because otherwise, it will be just a fuss. Okay. And um, the question that I'd like to know the answer to is, what actually happens when the COP is actually being hosted here in Australia? Is it an equal partnership between the Pacific and Australia, or is it going to be an Australian agenda? I mean, we heard what happened in Dubai, okay? It was taken over by the, the fossil fuel industry. What are we going to be seeing happening here in Australia? Are we going to be seeing something that will make a commitment to saving the future of Pacific Island countries, or is it about endorsing what it is that Australia is doing? And so, while there would be benefit in, in a joint um, hosting arrangement, I think there are some real dangers. And unless there are some, some very genuine commitments, it's going to be a total fuss. Thank you. Um, Monique, I wanted to ask you about one of your favorite topics, integrity in politics. What does integrity mean when it comes to climate policy and um, why is it important? What a lovely question. Um, well, the first thing, I guess, is transparency. So we have this incredible, increasing tr tr trust deficit. We don't trust politicians. We don't trust government. Uh, increasingly, we don't trust major institutions in this country. And I think that was there before COVID, but I think it's been exacerbated by COVID. If we want to be able to trust the government, we need to have faith in, in the, uh, the underpinning of the decisions that it makes. And we don't have that without the transparency. So the, 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 the work that I and other members of the crossbench have been doing has been trying to understand the basis of policy development by the government and to, I guess, to force the government to be accountable for the decisions that it makes and the bills that it puts up. It's been, it's been really quite difficult because you know, as you would expect, and I suppose it's, a, it's probably a long-standing thing, it's probably always been thus, uh, there's a lot of obfuscation and lack of transparency around, around the decision-making that, um, that, we, that we see. And it's incredibly disappointing that, this sounds probably incredibly naive, but that, that there's so much transactional politics underpinning what happens. So at the very end of last year, you know, we were, we were passing one piece of legislation and the, the Greens weren't going to okay in the House. And so the, the, the government, having said to us for 18 months that they would not pass a water trigger, gave us a water trigger overnight. Didn't even tell us it was coming. It sort of a appeared on the table I uh, in the House in, in the last week of the year. Incredible thing, really important, great contribution, but, but it wasn't because they wanted to make that change or because they really believed it was the right thing to do, it was because they were forced to do it because they wanted to get the IR legislation up. So I guess what, what, what I and what other people would like is transparency around decision making. We don't want to learn that the sea dump... We, we knew that the sea dumping bill that was passed last year was because the government wanted to facilitate the actions of Santos, but we can only prove it last week because Rex Patrick did a whole series of FOIs and we got the email trail. That's the frustrating thing. And so I've got a private member's bill which is in, in, in front of the House now, which it says we open up the diaries, let us know who the lobbyists are meeting with and when, in, re, you know, in, in a, as close as possible as real time. The lobbyist diaries and the ministerial diaries so that we can, we can see the trail of decision-making, because a lot of this decision-making seems to be remarkably last minute for things which are actually really, really important. And, and the other, uh, there's some other, other pieces to that uh, bill, but the other one is that the, I think the next most important is closing the revolving door. So every minerals and energy minister since 2001 has exited politics and gone straight to a job in minerals and in energy industry in this country. 
coincidence? <laughs> I think not. <laughs> you know, that, uh, with the mud bill, would be stopped. You know, you, you can't get, a, if you're a minister or a senior public servant, you can't get a job in the industry that, or in the area where you were a minister for three years after leaving par parliament. Christopher Pine, it was five days before he went to defence. You know, our, our previous prime minister, admittedly busy man, five ministries, but, uh, portfolios, <laughs> but, you know, he negotiates a $268 billion deal with Mike Pompeo for AUKUS, and who's he working with these days? Mike Pompeo on defence procurements for the US. I mean, you know, you want to restore trust, you've got to have transparency, you've got to un have an understanding of the basis for decision making, and, and, and for mine, that's, you know, you have to open the diaries and you have to stop the revolving door of appointments, and that would go some way to improving people's belief in the underpinning of the decisions that our government makes. Um, we're about to open up the floor to questions, so if you've got a question, feel free to jump into one of the aisles, maybe we'll, we'll, we've got somebody with a roaming mic, I hope, yeah. Um, but I was just going to ask one quick question that I still had for Anote before we pass it over to the audience, which was, how do you maintain hope in the face of this uh, very, very long existential campaign that you're waging? Yeah, I may look normal, but I'm quite uh, abnormal. You know, I'm very upset. I'm, I'm almost psycho psychotic. But let me say that, uh, you know, it's not been an easy thing. Um, and I must say that over the years that I've been involved in this, there have been times when I have literally get, got so, over, so overwhelmed with what's at stake that in, in a sense it paralyzes you into inaction. You know, you just think there's nothing we can do about it. You know, let's just give up. And it's real. But uh, I guess my wife here keeps pestering me because, you know, we could never give up because we got almost 30 grandchildren. <laughs> okay? 30 grandchildren. And so it's real. It's very personal. We watch our grandchildren play and we wonder, you know, what is to become of them. It's very personal. And it's real because of what is ahead of us, and it's not, the future is not good. And so, it's really struggling, and I must admit, there are times when I just switch off, I say, I just, w I wanna give up for a while, because otherwise, it's, it gets too heavy, okay? And uh, let me share, sometimes, my, I've, I've been, because I'm retired, and I really want to stop traveling. <laughs> I don't want to travel anymore, I don't want to do this anymore, but my, this one keeps reminding me, and I, sometimes I wonder, why is she sending me away? She's having a, she's cheating behind me or what? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that um, there is no alternative. Because the alternative is just not acceptable. So we have to keep fighting, believing that in spite of all that is there, the, the challenge and the insurmountable challenge, there must be an answer somewhere. We just have to find it. Um, look, I, I just want to add something. I mean, firstly, well, thank you for applauding that and, and, and thank you, Monique, for being here tonight. But just, I want you all to picture that it, for Anote and his wife, Maymay, to be here, they have to fly from Kiribati to Fiji, from Fiji to Australia, they're here for a couple of weeks, they're retired. We put this work on them. Like, isn't it great to live in one of the richest countries in the world that can drop a lazy 11 billion a year on fossil fuel subsidies, that can approve new coal mines, that can play politics with all this stuff? And it's people like Anote and Maymay who are literally traveling around the world in their retirement trying to ask us to stop. So can we just give them another round of applause for coming? All right, looks like we've got a question down the back there. Thank you. We are damned fools and nothing is going to change because we only have to look at the track record of the fossilised fascist donor duopoly over the last 50 years. 
Throughout the 70s, the world's top scientists wrote brilliant books telling us what the, uh, our situation is. Uh, and in 1979, the World Climate Council, uh, 340 scientists met in Geneva and declared an emergency. And the thrust is that um, 1990 is the tipping point when the soils, the air and the water uh, is ruined uh, beyond repair. Uh, and, um, it, you know, I, I mean, the way they're going, um, uh, uh, you can guarantee one thing, nothing uh, is going to change, uh, and it was all over in uh, 1990. We'll take that as a, oh, a statement. You want to you add something? I want to have a go. Um, no, that's not true. Um, the world is so much better than it used to be and so much worse than it used to be. Change is the only constant. Strap in. And in a democracy, the only way you change things is when the people that want things to change care more than the people that don't want them to change. Right? No big change is easy. We didn't give women the vote. They fought for it. They got locked up. They got beaten up. F.W. de Klerk didn't give black people a vote in, in South Africa. They fought for it. They died for it. Now, climate change is harder because there's a deadline. Right? It's a big social change with a deadline. Uh, but, you know, as, as one of my mentors who died a few years ago, Professor Tony McMichael, who kind of did a lot, probably more than most, to bring climate change into the public health debate, what Tony McMichael said to me 25 years ago when I first asked him what gave him hope, he said nothing. Because uh, <laughs> hope is not a strategy. Right? Hard work changes things, not hope. Uh, but what Tony said to me 25 years ago was never forget, Richard, and this was a long time ago, uh, that one and a half degrees is a lot better than two. Never forget that two degrees is a lot better than two and a half. So it's actually a luxury to give up. It's a luxury to be despondent. It's a luxury to think, oh, we missed the boat. Because we can still make an enormous difference, comma, if we work our asses off. Don't hope. Rely on my fuel, white hot rage. All right, we're hoping to squeeze in a couple more questions here. Uh, thank you very much for a really interesting discussion. Uh, my question is about a couple of phrases that uh, came up. Our Pacific neighbours, our Pacific partners. Surely part of the problem is that we have a long and shameful history in this country where our governments and many of our citizens don't truly treat uh, the Pacific Island societies as sovereign nations or as equals on an international footing. How do we overcome that to actually work together on this critical issue? <coughs> yeah, let me try. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think what's important to understand is um, it's not always Australia's problem. We must accept a lot of the, pro the, of the blame because we allow Australia to do it. We've got to fight. We've got to tell Australia, no, they don't do this. It's not easy, I can tell you. But there are times when we simply, I mean, uh, I can recall my confrontations with your five prime ministers, including John Howard, who is a very, very, he's a bully, good, but very, but he's an honorable man. Hmm? But, uh, but because we allow him to bully us, he gets away with it. But we've got to fight. The very first meeting, I met John Howard, we had an argument in 2003. I just got elected into office and we had a, a fight in, in Auckland over the selection of the Secretary General. Because he came in and he said, oh, I want my, he was lobbying for his candidate to be elected to the, to the Secretary General and he, saw, he, set a, he set a new a set of criteria for the election and then changed it the next day. So I said, the, 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 I was sitting next to the uh, Prime Minister of Tonga, now the king. And he said, hey, he's eliminating your candidate. What, are you going to say anything? And he said, he didn't want, maybe he didn't support his candidate. But I said, so, come on. Yesterday you changed 
you, you, you set a, a set of criteria, and now you're changing it. So it's convenient. You know, so, but I think we have to fight, even within amongst ourselves. Because, and so to be an independent country, you've got to, you've got to assert yourself. And I think, I think the, the greatest lesson we learned is on the climate change issue. Because we'd gone along, we, we, we regarded ourselves as small island states, inconsequential in the global affairs, and uh, we've been getting the bad end of the stick all of this while. But on climate change, we had to step in because we are doomed to extinction if we did not, and we cannot continue to stand on the sidelines. So yes, I think there will always be that. I mean, the, the bullies will always be the bullies, Unless you get a good bully. Uh, and I don't know any good bullies yet. <laughs> but uh, I, um, quite apart from that, let me be quite fair. We've had a, a very, very fruitful relationship with our larger partners in the main. But of course, when it comes to whether they, it goes in our, whether the decisions should be in our favor or the other, it's, oh, naturally, it's always in the interest of your own country. And I think that is the problem. Because climate change, we continue to regard it from our national perspectives, and not as a global phenomenon, which it is. That whatever we do here in Australia impacts what, what happens to us in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That is the problem. Um, hello, Anote. I just want to thank you for your film, Anote's Ark. It, it, it inspired me to become a climate activist um, several years ago. Um, my question is, I have done, you know, petitions and harassing politicians and blocking roads and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and obviously you get a lot of critique for that. Um, great topic on the Extinction Rebellion protests this week. Um, if you could give me one thing to channel my white hot rage into, um, or, or one sort of angle to take to be more effective because it's so exhausting. Please give me some advice. What should I be doing? You, you don't want to hear this. <laughs> you really don't want to hear it because uh, if I had nuclear bombs, I think I'd be prescribing some. But, you know, this, <laughs> this is a reflection of the deep frustration we feel. Mm -hmm. Because here, here's the world bent on destroying our world. Bent on destroying our world, how would you feel? And uh, quite frankly, in my private moments, dark moments, there are times when I say, come on, let's destroy it together. If that is what you want. Because uh, quite frankly, our world is gone. We don't have a future as, as, a, as a country, as a people. Okay? According to the scenario, the projections. But we are there because we are part of humanity. And we must say that it's happening to us. Let it not happen to you. And so what can I prescribe? I think what's happening, oh, well, we, we've been talking about this uh, rather informally, but I, uh, in my moments of total despair, I say it's, it's a waste of time. But then I look back, and I've seen a significant increase in momentum of climate action from the time when I started. And so a lot more people are there, but I make the, uh, the qualification that uh, whilst the moral people are on board, it's the moral ones that are laughing at us, the ones that believe they benefit by all of this and don't care what happens to the rest of us. And so unless we can touch them in a way that they feel I'm afraid they probably will continue to laugh at us because I've seen the change in the strategy of the fossil fuel industry. When I started off, they were attacking the science. And I remember an event in Auckland when, with the, the chair then of the IPCC, Dr. Bachari, and somebody saying the science, he says, no, the science is, 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 uh, is clear. It's very clear. But then they went missing. The fossil fuel industry went missing. And uh, our mistake was saying, we've defeated them. They did not. They went underground. And I think in, in uh, 
Jeffrey Sachs' words when he came here in Australia, I think 2018, he said, they've taken control of your governments. Okay? And so the ones that I, you know, I, I, heard, I came across the term regulatory capture. And I, what's that mean? What it means is the ones that are supposed to be regulated have actually captured the ones that are supposed to be doing the regulating. And I think that is the problem. I, last time I was here, I was asking Dennis, uh, the Richard, and everybody, why is this happening? Why is the new government not doing what it, it made us believe it would do? And uh, the suggestion was that, okay, I didn't say it, but Jeffrey Sachs said it with his own country in, 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 uh, in the United States. And he was uh, suggesting that it's maybe it may be happening here, which is so sad. So sad it seems to suggest that maybe there is nothing we can do about it. But maybe there is. We have to believe that there is. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that's about all we've got time for, even though I'm sure many of us could sit and listen to Enote for many, many hours. Um, thank you all so much for coming along tonight. Um, and special thanks to Richard Dennis, Dr. Monique Ryan, and His Excellency Enote Tong. And Mei Mei for being here as well and traveling all this way. Um, yeah, if you would like to ask any other questions, I'm sure our panelists will be hanging around. Um, and thank you again. Um, somebody also just wanted me to let you all know there is water just out in the foyer if you need a water on the way out. Um, and thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>